Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the webinar, Creating Connection, Unifying Architectural and Civil Engineering Design. My name is Sarah Snavely, and I will be moderating today's session. The session will be provided both audio and web conference and will last approximately one hour, including Q&A at the end. If you have a question at any point during today's presentation, you may submit it via the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. Everyone on today's call will receive a certificate of completion from us via email. Uh, we will also be submitting AIA credits to AIA for you. Um, the certificate should serve as self-reporting for any other credits that you may need um, otherwise. If you have any questions, feel free to contact me at the end of this presentation. But we will open up to the presentation now. Our speaker for today is Brian Crutchfield from Timmins Group. Today, we are going to take a look at the collaborative opportunities inherent in the design process that enable building architecture and site design to positively influence each other. We will look at critical site constraints, site elements programming, and connectivity, both physically and aesthetically, using site elements to expand a sense of place beyond the confines of the structure. And now it's my pleasure to introduce Brian. Go ahead and take it away. Thanks, Sarah. Um, appreciate everyone joining us today um, for this webinar. Uh, this is a little new for us uh, as we're all in some new times right now. Hopefully you'll find it informative and helpful, especially as uh, a lot of our uh, credit opportunities have, have fallen by the wayside here, especially this spring with conferences. So uh, we're starting this off as, a, as part of a series. Uh, so be on the lookout for other opportunities in the upcoming weeks for other presentations and other opportunities to, uh, to earn some, some AIA credits. This particular presentation um, is something we came up with a little while back um, uh, about how we can uh, really collaborate well uh, between not just architecture and civil engineering, but really all design trades. Um, it, uh, it's very important um, to developers and owners to, to have a unified uh, design team, um, and it, it's never more obvious than when that's not taking place. So hopefully you'll learn a little something about some of the approaches that, uh, that we try to take on, on a project basis, how they can help influence uh, architectural design, how, uh, how other designers can, uh, can work closely with you, just to make sure we're, we're coming up with the, the best product at the end of the day for our, uh, for our owners and, um, and clients. Uh, again, I'm Brian Crutchfield. I'm the principal for our uh, for Timmins Group, Charlotte and uh, Greensboro offices. Uh, my background is is in land development, site development, design, uh, both on the public and private side. Uh, so we've uh, both tried to apply some of these principles um, to small commercial sites, uh, to large federal sites, to uh, you know to typical uh, higher ed, K-12, uh, you name it, um, uh, types of projects. A little bit about our firm, uh, for those of you who aren't familiar with Timmins, uh, we're a little over 700 people scattered uh, throughout the uh, Mid-Atlantic and Southeast, headquarters uh, just outside of Richmond in Chesterfield County, Virginia. Uh, we are full service, uh, site design, uh, uh, civil engineering, surveying, landscape architecture firm. Uh, we primarily focus uh, outside of the buildings uh, on our services. Uh, we've been privileged enough over the past 25 years to, uh, to be named the ENR's top uh, 500 design firms. Our offices are uh, located, um, as I mentioned, Mid-Atlantic and Southeast, uh, headquartered in Richmond with offices throughout Virginia uh, and just outside of Baltimore, and four offices throughout North Carolina, <clears throat> including Raleigh, Greensboro, Charlotte, and uh, Elizabeth City. Uh, we also have uh, some offices um, uh, outside of this region in uh, Dallas, uh, just outside of the Dallas area in Phoenix area. Uh, our services range from landscape architecture, uh, site engineering, land surveying. Uh, we also have specialties in water wastewater design, uh, site selection planning uh, and economic development, uh, transportation design, stormwater management, uh, environmental services, uh, geotech and CMT. So pretty much full service, anything you need outside the building, uh, we, we can perform those services in-house. <clears throat> uh, so getting into our program, and, and uh, typically we like to keep this pretty interactive, a little tougher to do in a webinar setting, but as Sarah mentioned, feel free to, to drop your questions in the Q&A 
if, if it's in the middle of a topic, we'll try to pause and, and answer questions. If not, we'll save a few minutes at the end to, uh, to be able to dive in a little deeper and answer questions. So uh, um, uh, I don't really like listening to myself talk this uh, straight through, but um, we're going to make the, the best of it and hopefully um, keep it uh, uh, fairly informal. Um, so our approach, we've kind of broken this down into, uh, into five steps of how to effectively collaborate on, uh, on site design and how to blend that with the overall design of projects. Um, the five steps uh, being, you know, start with a comprehensive contract, uh, identify site constraints, uh, establish a site program, uh, going through the actual site design process, and then regulatory review and permitting. So we're going to dive in a little deeper on um, uh, on each of these subjects uh, uh, going forward here. So step one, we've got to always start with a contract. Um, you know, this can be, uh, sometimes contracts are held uh, between the designers and the architects. Sometimes they're held between the designers and the, uh, the owner. But in either case, we want to make sure it's comprehensive, that we uh, don't have overlapping services, and that we've captured everything that the owner's going to need um, on this project. So under these considerations, uh, we've got basic design services. Most, if not all, projects um, that, that involve land development, construction of a new building, um, or, or, or major modifications are going to require some level of civil engineering design, some level of landscape architecture design, and then, of course, the, uh, the site plan approval process. Um, depending on how the owner wants to stru structure a, uh, a, a contract, you could have additional subconsultants involved, you could roll everything under the civil, um, or they may task the architectural design team with uh, subcontracting out some of these um, uh, additional services. Um, on the site investigation side, you know, topographic and boundary surveys, uh, underground utility locations, geotech, uh, special inspections, testing, wetland delineation, environmental studies, traffic studies, just depending on the complexity of your project, we should go through this list on every project and make sure either A, we know who's going to be handling that, who's going to carry that in their contract, um, and also if it's truly required or if it's something that doesn't necessarily apply to our project. The worst assumption we can uh, make in cases is that somebody else is going to handle that and uh, that, that somebody else has got it under their umbrella. We don't want to get too far down the road on this project and then all of a sudden start sending uh, change in scope items to, to, to owners and getting them frustrated that we didn't have this, this kind of thing identified early on. So having close collaboration between the owner and design team to understand what's required and what needs to be included in contracts um, before we get started um, is very important. Um, some additional design and permitting services uh, that can come up. You don't all you may not be able to identify those uh, before we get started on a project, but it's something we want to think about and try to identify as early as we can. Um, those can be off-site improvements, maybe DOTs uh, requiring us to, to uh, uh, install a, a turn lane. Maybe we've got to install a traffic signal. Um, maybe there's some wetland permitting that needs to take place. Uh, or some other permitting process that we haven't really accounted for. Uh, we want to keep those uh, on the forefront and make sure we're understanding who's going to be handling that and uh, if it's required on a project. Um, construction administration can be uh, 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 vary quite a bit from project to project. Um, different owners will require different levels of CA on projects. We want to have those discussions very early on to understand what the uh, uh, what the desires are and and what the goals are of that um, are we expected to be on site doing inspection reports or um, site reports every week uh, or is it a monthly check-in or is it just show up at the end of the project when we want you to do a punch and um, certify that everything's been done correctly make sure we get that scope uh, to to match the expectations and requirements of the owner um, uh, on uh, uh, you know other things that we need to coordinate amongst design team members that could uh, that could shift a little bit or could be things such as site retaining walls. Uh, sometimes they're designed by the structural engineer, sometimes by the civil engineer. Sometimes they're done uh, design build with a uh, performance specification. Um, so we want to understand who's handling that if that needs to come up, uh, to, just so we're not assuming somebody else is handling it. 
<clears throat> if there are any exhibits that are required, uh, whether it be for rezoning, architectural review boards, if you need uh, site renderings, sometimes the architecture team handles that, sometimes the landscape architect handles that, sometimes the civil engineer handles that. So we want to have those discussions and make sure we've got that either we haven't double counted it somewhere in our scopes or uh, that it's been left out and it'll come up. Uh, pavement design is another one. Sometimes the geotech will take care of that design. Sometimes the civil will, will take care of that design. Um, and then cost estimating. Sometimes there's a third party uh, cost estimator. Sometimes we're asked to do some engineering cost estimates in-house. <clears throat> so now that we've got a contract and we understand who's doing what and, uh, and, and how it's taking place, um, we really need to start diving into the site and, uh, and understanding the site con uh, constraints. So that's step two for us. Um, this is really important to, to get uh, identified very early on in a project. Um, uh, sometimes in projects, uh, an owner may reach out to an architect and ask them to, um, you know, uh, they've got a great idea of the type of building they want to build, their, their building program. Um, you work really hard on uh, identifying what that floor plate needs to look like. Is it multi-story? Is it single story? They've got a piece of land that they've already identified. There's been some test fits that have done. Um, they're geared up, they're ready to go, and then a civil engineer is engaged. And typically, uh, when we get engaged at that point, all we do is bring bad news to a project. Um, sometimes it's there's wetlands on the site, sometimes there's rock on the site, sometimes there's off-site utility extensions that need to take place, and all of a sudden, a lot of the money that the owner has, has been wanting to spend on the building is now getting sunk into the site. So the earlier we can get involved and identify some of these items, um, the less risk it is to the owner uh, uh, to, uh, to, to take a gamble on a site and um, the, the more assurances we can give them uh, that what they want to do is, is buildable and affordable. So some of these constraints uh, can be on the physical side, property boundary, topographic information, um, any types of uh, existing uh, hardscape buildings that are on the site. Um, you want to identify any historic features such as cemeteries or significant trees. Um, of course, the standard items are wetlands, streams, floodplains, um, and really diving into uh, things that could affect the overall design of the site, adequacy of drainage outfalls, adequacy of the uh, existing utilities um, and looking at where we can access from public roads. Brian? Um, yeah. You have a quick question. Um, you want to identify like the challenge of coordinating services when the architect and the civil are under separate owner contracts? Yeah, that is that can get uh, uh, pretty difficult at times, especially if the owner is trying to uh, uh, trying to manage those very closely. Um, what we've done in the past is one of the first questions we'll ask when an owner comes to us and, and requests a, uh, a proposal, we'll ask them who the other design team members are, if they've already got an architect on board, and we'll pick, the, pick up the phone and call and, and, and have some direct calls or, e or either a conference call with the owner just to make sure we're closely coordinated on those items. Um, when everybody kind of works in a vacuum, that, that's typically when things get left out or things are overlapped uh, between scopes. So we, we do uh, recommend that owners get the entire design team on board as early as they can so we can start coordinators as early as we can. <clears throat> so uh, continuing on the site constraints, um, some of the regulatory ones, obviously your zoning, can the, the intended use actually go on the site without a rezoning being required? Uh, are there any limitations to uh, building heights, to floor area ratios? What are the parking requirements, uh, any type of buffer requirements? Um, those can vary wildly between jurisdictions. So we really want to understand what those constraints are to make sure we work, work with them. Um, uh, another item is if, it's, if the site is already zoned, I'll say uh, uh, be cautioned. Uh, we need to contact the locality <clears throat> and get a copy of any zoning conditions that may be attached to, uh, to that site. Uh, many times the uh, sites nowadays aren't rezoned um, straight up and by right. They all have conditions with them. Sometimes it limits the use. Sometimes it limits the building height. Sometimes it could limit even the, the, uh, the overall impervious coverage that you can put on the site. So um, trying to identify those and uncover those early is uh, extremely important. 
So once we've identified a lot of our constraints, we're gonna start pulling together a base map uh, that'll include all the physical constraints, regulatory constraints, um, uh, and, and really getting them in a fashion that everybody can, can uh, look at and understand. It can be clear and concise so the owner can, can understand what these, um, what these ice, uh, items are. Um, we always tell uh, even our young engineers, um, when you're doing this, make sure you walk the site. Uh, because there may be stuff that if we're using GIS data or even if we're using good field run topographic data, um, there could be items that have, that have come up since those items have, have taken or since those uh, features have been uh, recorded in GIS fashion. Um, you know, uh, sometimes there's uh, uh, things such as power lines or uh, utility extensions may have come through sites that we want to know about before we get too far down the road. So we'll go through a quick example of how we pull together a site constraints map. Um, this particular site is about 200 acres, 20, uh, 207.84. Um, and all we've brought in so far are the, uh, the boundaries of the site, the adjacent properties, um, uh, property lines, and an aerial photograph. So we know where the site is. We've been to it. The photos on the right um, show uh, what the site looks like today. It's primarily farmland. And uh, 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 um, it's got some pasture and some, uh, some fencing around it. So we're gonna use our data sources and start pulling in um, uh, additional layers into this. <clears throat> We've uh, spoken with the county and, and understand that they have some desires of some road connectivity. So we wanna understand um, what could be impactful to this site, including um, roads that, that uh, the county has asked for, saying you know, they may want uh, this east-west connector road to service this property, as well as a way to connect Cane Road in a north-south fashion to that. Uh, so we may have some flexibility on where that goes, but generally speaking, we want to um, account for that as early on as we can. So we plotted those roads on the site um, to, uh, uh, as, as a placeholder. Then we start bringing in additional information. Uh, the green lines here are the, uh, uh, the sanitary sewer trunk lines. So we've actually got two of those, which is a little odd, um, running through this site. Um, one thing you can fairly well be assured of, the sanitary sewer, when it's in a gravity fashion, is gonna be running along a low. So wherever there's sanitary sewer, we can pretty well bet there's gonna be a low area, whether it's a creek or um, just a low-lying area in general, <clears throat> um, that could be uh, something we've got to work around. <clears throat> um, as you can tell in the photo, we've actually got a, uh, an overhead transmission line that runs along the, the southern boundary of this property in blue. So we know we can't build under that um, uh, with any structures. There are some limits that we can place some items under it, uh, but we've got to work with the utility providers to better understand that. So we started with 208 acres. That's about 11 acres of usable acreage um, that's being taken away from this site because of this transmission line. Continue to bring in layers. Um, this yellow, uh, as I mentioned before, sewer probably runs along a low. We've got some floodplain um, along this area as well. That's another eight acres or so, almost nine acres that uh, is taken away usable. Uh, continuing to bring in uh, additional information. Uh, we've got some preliminary wetlands information. You can see in these little green areas, um, again, along these lows uh, that, uh, that could impact the development. That's another four and a half acres. Uh, we did a secondary study of that, identified a couple of other little pockets that the Corps could take jurisdiction over and have plotted those on the map um, as well. Um, and uh, finally, uh, we've also brought in, depending on your jurisdiction, you may have a resource protection area or RPA that's shown here in the purple. Um, uh, a lot of other places may just have stream buffers or wetlands buffers uh, that are outside of those stream and wetlands areas. So we wanna get those plotted as well. So quickly we've gone from a 208 acre site down to probably about 100 and 60 usable acres on this site um, just by applying the, the, uh, the constraints. And then last but not least, uh, we bring in the topography. We got a lot of fall um, on both sides. There's kind of a ridge that runs through the middle, falls to the creek on the left and falls to the creek on the, on the right. So quickly this somewhat rectangular site that was 208 acres 
has been reduced by about 40 acres once you apply all these constraints. And not only that, it's really chopped this site up into, you know, uh, into four different development areas. You know, on the, on the west side of the, the creek, on the east side, uh, and then the road splits it or potential road connection splits it, and then we got two more pods there. So that's going to start influencing how we can lay this site out and what size buildings we can fit instead of just taking that first image that I had of just the parcel boundaries and the aerial and trying to max out what size building you can fit. Let's get these constraints uh, on the site and work around them versus being reactionary to them after the fact. <clears throat> uh, another example, um, you know, if you're working on smaller urban sites, uh, they still have constraints. They're different constraints than a, than a rural uh, raw land site, uh, but constraints nonetheless. In most cases, in these urban examples, you'll see a, 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 a bevy of utilities around here. So the yellow being gas lines, the blue being water lines, the green being sanitary sewer lines. We've pretty much wrapped this entire site with utilities. Uh, we've got some storm sewer. We've got some uh, topographic challenges along here. Um, so we've gotten all those brought in. So if we're going to redevelop this site or do some expansions, we want to understand where those can take place with minimal rework that's going to need to take place with, uh, with some of those features. So it's equally important on uh, small urban sites as it is on um, uh, large rural raw land sites. So we've got our contract, we've got our constraints maps, we understand what's going on. Now it's time to really get into the design part. So step three is we're gonna establish a desired site program. This is not unlike uh, uh, on the architectural side where you're sitting down with the owner and just peppering them with questions to establish a building program. Very similar, we, we've got a whole laundry list of items that we wanna ask a ton of questions and get their answers, reactions, or at least um, put a seed in their in their mind for things that they need to be thinking about uh, of how to service this site. Um, so a lot of the site program elements we're going to ask questions about are, you know, starting with parking lots. You know, we can design off of the code minimum required, uh, but we want to ask the question to make sure that's going to be enough. Uh, we definitely don't want to under park any facility, so we're gonna um, ask them how many people are gonna be working in the facility, how many people are gonna be visiting, and really try to start getting to a final number of, uh, of what's the minimum number of spaces that they, can, uh, that they can go with. And then we'll take the, um, the greater of whatever they need or what's required by code and, uh, and design to that. Uh, we wanna factor in not just the day-to-day, -day, but we're gonna ask questions about special events uh, do they intend to have community meetings at some of these places? Are they going to have, you know, a once a year festival at this place? We may not have to design the parking lot for that once a year event, but we want to factor it in and understand um, if we need to have some overflow parking for those special events. Uh, do we have green space that's graded relatively flat? Do we have some gravel areas? Are there adjacent places that we can park? Uh, we want to at least plan for it and see if we can satisfy it. Um, uh, uh, on the same lines as the parking, uh, do we have any drop-off areas? Uh, do, do, if it's a school, do you need to accommodate buses or a parent drop-off for, uh, 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 for those facilities? Or is it um, more for uh, more of a transient um, employment area that where we may have people arriving to work? by bus. <clears throat> you know, same thing along the lines of public transportation, um, accommodating bike lanes, bike parking, um, things of that nature. Uh, service areas are one that, that gets overlooked or, or kicked to the end of the project quite a bit. Um, so we want to understand how they're going to handle uh, trash collection to make sure we account for either a, a dumpster and a dumpster enclosure on the site, any, comp any trash compactors that are needed, uh, how, to, how are they getting deliveries? Um, do they need loading docks? So we're gonna ask a lot of questions about that. Brian? Yes. Has Timmins Group ever successfully provided fewer parking spaces than required by zoning and how difficult was that? And were the municipalities receptive to it? 
Uh, the answer to that is yes, and it's really dependent on um, on the locality. Uh, it, for the localities that ha have really detailed zoning and land use ordinances, it's a little tougher to uh, to, to park less than uh, what's required by code. Uh, but we have, in many cases, uh, argued that um, uh, yeah, that these buildings may not fit a definition completely that's that's in the zoning ordinance for the use so we can go to them with a case of of we've done our due diligence and understand exactly how many parking spaces are required um, for the use of this building and maybe we can qualify some different areas as um, as storage versus office or maybe it's some hybrid of, of the facility so the answer to that is yes you you can do it it's not always um, uh, cut and dry if it's an office building and you just are going to have really large offices and not many people working there, that's going to be a little tougher to overcome because they have to assume that uh, this user may leave and somebody may do a new update and need twice the amount of parking within there. Um, you can't apply for variances, but you typically have to show a hardship for that um, in order to get a variance. So it's really on a locality by locality basis as to how easy that is to, um, to achieve. <clears throat> So on the, uh, continuing on the site program elephant elements, um, you know, more and more of our uh, clients and uh, owners are, uh, are really catering to the users of the building and, and um, site amenities. They, that could include walking trails, uh, ball fields, green space areas, sitting areas, um, areas to, uh, for the group to get together and, and, and work out on mornings and evenings. So we wanna ask some questions if we need to build any amenity spaces <clears throat> into the site itself uh, for, uh, for meeting. Um, and then once we identify that, we want to understand what the focus is at. Is it for presentations? Is it for just passive recreation? Um, uh, that way we can group those in the correct locations and also separate it um, from other items on the site as needed. Uh, security measures can become uh, uh, a big factor as well. You know, is this a secure perimeter site? Do we need gates, guard houses, um, card readers, uh, or is it more of a passive security site where everything's open, uh, but we keep sight lines for security, um, more of the septed uh, uh, side of things. Um, and then stormwater management, um, this one gets overlooked a lot as well uh, until the end of the project and we're trying to cram in a pond or, uh, or, or some type of bioretention area in a place that it may not um, work real well. So we want to identify those spaces early on. Um, it's best if you can work it with the functional um, layout itself, trying to keep it down gradient at the low point of the site. That way we're not having to regrade uh, and move more dirt than we, than we really have to. Um, we get asked a lot of how much should we allocate for stormwater management. A uh, good rule of thumb is about 10 to 15% of the site area. You can, if you reserve an area of that, uh, that size, more times than not, you'll, you'll be covered, unless you're in a coastal area or a, a environmentally sensitive area where we, those requirements may go up uh, a little more. So we've got our base mapping, we've got our site program, we know what we're, we're designing. Uh, now it's time to get, put pencil to paper and really start uh, designing. Um, the tendency is for a lot of engineers um, is to, once we get all this information, we're gonna go lock ourselves in our office and, and go crazy designing. Um, that's not a great thing to do. Uh, you know, we need to stay collaborative with the rest of the design team and dialoguing along the way. Here's some things that we can talk about on the site design goals while we're designing the sites um, the, to keep things so they, they flow together and are um, uh, actually work together on the site versus it looking like you've got a site design in one place and a building design in another place and the two just don't work together. So we wanna look at the operational efficiency of the layout. How, put, your, put yourself in the position of the uh, person arriving to the site can you, can you find the site and identify it easy? Can you identify how to access the site, where the entrances are, where the front door is, and keep things visible and, and signed accordingly? Um, try to minimize uh, the, uh, the amount of um, uh, pavement and impervious cover that we need to create some of these driveways. Um, we wanna try to 
keep that keep the site as cost effective as we can. When you start adding pavement, that does a lot of things. It doesn't just add costs um, for the pavement and the concrete. It adds grading costs. It adds stormwater management costs, um, and it could also you know trigger a lot of other requirements as far as landscaping screening and things of that nature so what are the elements of the site design that that could influence building uh, design uh, number one is the location and we'll talk about that a little bit of of how to um, uh, how to optimize the building location the parking drives and walks you know we where are we arriving from where are we trying to get to uh, that can influence the overall building design uh, grading considerations is a big one. Do we need to go multi-story and, and have a basement due to the topography or uh, is it tabletop flat and we're, we're just trying to get the site to, to drain? Um, and stormwater management is another one. How, how can we collect water from a building and treat it according to the um, uh, requirements? Uh, so what are the elements of the site design that require coordination with building design? Um, drainage is a big one. Um, you know, how are we collecting roof water and piping it away from the buildings? Utility connections and footing locations uh, are also important. So on the building location side, um, we typically try to optimize the solar orientation by putting the, the uh, long axis of the building in an east-west orientation. All sites don't allow for this. Um, uh, more and more sites that we work on are really tight and the building can only fit how the building can fit on the site. Um, but we want to start off with the desired and keeping that in mind, um, both from an energy standpoint and how things uh, uh, may work well uh, that way. We want to optimize uh, the building presentation and visibility. Uh, the architecture community is designing some really cool and nice looking buildings. Uh, we don't want to put it down in a hole and we don't want to hide it behind a bunch of trees where nobody can see it. So we want to place it in a location that's highly visible from the public way people can identify the structure and where they're trying to go to and, and how to get there. Um, you know, do we have options for multiple views? Is it, is it uh, on a corner where you got multiple streets? Um, how do we uh, optimize that? Uh, again, we want to clearly identify the front door and any other distinct entry points so people aren't driving around the site lost trying to figure out how to get in the building. We've all been there and done that before and uh, uh, it's, it can be frustrating if, uh, if it's not uh, easily identifiable where we're trying to go to. Um, soil conditions can be a, a big influencer as well. We, you know, that's why we go punch holes in the site. Is there a bunch of rock there? Is some unsuitable area? Sometimes the cost to remediate some of these soil issues um, can end up dictating where the building needs to go. Um, we may need to shift it one direction or another and, and keep the, uh, uh, the hardscape landscape areas in the tougher to work. Uh, soil areas and place the building in areas where the where the soils are are better. So identifying those early on and not being reactionary uh, is it, uh, is extremely helpful. <clears throat> so on the site design goals, again, I mentioned we want to see the building, we want to be able to approach it, arrive, park, and enter. Keeping it that simple, placing yourself in the in the uh, position of the person visiting the site is um, uh, is the, the starting point for this. Uh, consider wayfinding, you know, if you're a visitor, do you know where to go? Uh, looking at vehicular cir circulation, how can you safely get uh, cars in and out um, uh, along with pedestrian circulation of how can we minimize the amount of uh, times uh, pedestrians have to interact with vehicular traffic, um, keeping crossings, to an absolute minimum, having making sure they're in locations where they're easily uh, people can be easily seen and uh, identified um, to to minimize com potential uh, uh, possibilities for accidents. Um, looking at service vehicle access, do we want to find a, another way to bring those vehicles in? Do we not want tractor trailers and and dumpster trucks coming by our front door? We want to get them in and, and, and out as efficient as possible. Again, avoiding those uh, pedestrian interactions. Um, so then uh, we also are looking at grading. Um, we want to minimize the total amount of grading, minimize the total amount of earthwork uh, in order to minimize costs. Um, there's not an owner that we've worked with that wouldn't rather spend uh, the money that they've got available 
in the building and finishes and, and really making a high profile uh, looking building, um, then spend it on the site. You know, if we have to bury a bunch of rock or bl blast a bunch of rock, you can't see that. You can't, um, you can't uh, really appreciate that as far as an investment goes. So um, tougher to spend money on those items. So we want to minimize uh, those impacts. Uh, we typically design sites to, to balance the total movement of earth around the site. Um, ideally, you, you're going to keep your cut and fill areas to a minimal, but also keep those um, pretty close to each other. So that way, uh, the, the site contractor doesn't have to um, necessarily uh, take an excavator out, dig it up, put it in a truck, truck it to the exact opposite end of the site, dump it, have, have another piece of machinery there to spread it and compact it. If you can move dirt with a, with a dozer or with pans, um, that's going to end up being cheaper and more, um, uh, less time consuming at the end of the day. Uh, so we'll pre prepare cut fill maps that show where we're getting dirt from and where we're moving it to just so we can understand and uh, appreciate how the dirt's going to have to get moved around this site. Um, most owners we work with uh, hate retaining walls. They want to avoid them at all costs. Um, sometimes that's just not possible to, to fit the site program on. We definitely want to minimize them. Yep. Yeah. What is moving dirt, quote unquote, with a pan? So a pan is, uh, is a single vehicle that has a, some people call them scrapers. So they, uh, uh, they basically drive over the dirt and it has a, a blade on the bottom that scoops it up into, uh, uh, into a storage area. It can drive to the other end of the site and dump it out. So it's a single piece of equipment that can move dirt by itself versus needing multiple pieces of equipment to dig it, haul it, dump it, spread it. So, um, but there's, uh, I'm sure there's more technical words than, uh, than pan, but that's generally how it's, uh, how it's executed. <clears throat> um, so again, on the walls, uh, sometimes it's been, sometimes it's beneficial to use them, um, helps you, uh, get more density on the site, but we want to minimize, uh, the cost of those and, uh, uh, potential maintenance of them as well. Uh, we want to identify existing satisfactory versus unsatisfactory material. If we've got a lot of overburden on the site, you know, it could be uh, old farmland that's cultivated soils that we really can't put a structure on. Um, we don't want to have to haul that off, uh, but if we can place it strategically around the site in berms or um, other landscape areas to waste it, um, that'll be more cost effective. Uh, we want to identify the presence of rock, obviously, um, and create our grading design to uh, avoid the need to remove it if we can. Um, sometimes that means um, maybe even hauling in some dirt and building over the rock versus trying to balance the site and having to do a lot of blasting and uh, bury rock somewhere on the site. Um, and as you're designing the building, we're of course communicating on what those bearing conditions are and what those uh, footing conditions need to be. So we're optimizing the entire uh, design of the building and site together. Um, Brian, yep. going back just a little bit, how much have you seen on-site green power like solar and other sustainable desires or requirements drive site design recently? Uh, I wouldn't say we've seen a whole lot driving site design. Um, we have seen it as a tag on, mostly I would say on the public side, um, uh, projects where folks are, are going for uh, a little bit more greener development. Um, we have seen it on some private sites where there's a lot of uh, density or there's a high, high power usage anticipated for the site to help offset it. Um, those are, uh, th that's another item to add to the question, you know, when we're going through the site program exercise of, you know, what, what is your desirability from a green uh, standpoint? Are we you know, uh, are we trying to achieve some type of lead equivalent or are we just trying to build the most efficient building um, that we can uh, cost wise? So starting to see, you know, things starting to tilt a little bit better towards um, the efficiency of solar, uh, but it's still not quite there as far as, you know, unless you've got a really big site that you can put a, uh, you know, whole field of solar panels out on. So. Um, don't see it a ton, but we have adapted it on uh, uh, some projects from time to time. Okay, we've got one more if you don't mind. Sure. Um, how does one ensure that the topsoil, which is cut, remains on the top 
when filled in another area of the site? Or in another, other words, how do you manage soil stratification in moving dirt? Right. So um, in our sequence of earth moving operations, you know, we've identified in the geotech report what the, the depth of topsoil is on the site. And step one is always strip that topsoil off. Um, so that should be stripped and stockpiled. We'll identify a, st a topsoil stockpile location on the site that'll remain pretty much throughout construction. So when you drive by a site and you see a mountain of dirt sitting somewhere, chances are that's a lot of topsoil that the uh, site contractor is saving uh, to respread at the end of the um, end of the project. Uh, depending on the site contractor you get, depends on how clean they keep that and how you know, segregated they can keep the material. Um, most are, are fairly decent at it, but you know, we're, we're scrutinizing that quite a bit at the end of the project to make sure when they do respread it, that it doesn't have a bunch of rocks and, and sticks and things like that in it that are just going to make for a, a, a not very pleasant landscape at the end of the day. <clears throat> uh, so continuing on on grading, um, we want to make sure we're going to meet all of the code requirements from accessibility uh, which uh, you know getting from the building to the accessible parking um, we can slope up to five percent which is one in 20. Um, uh, if we can stay below that it's not considered a ramp uh, we have to stay below two percent maximum cross slope uh, and um, anytime we go greater than five percent up an accessible path uh, up to one in 12 it's considered a ramp which means we may have to do handrails uh, and landings at the, uh, the end of them. So any short ramps that are less than six inches of vertical rise do not require handrails. If you're going up more than six inches of vertical rise, they do require handrails. So we wanna to try to keep those to a minimum, but also make sure when we're grading the site that we can accommodate all ADA requirements. Um, General grading recommendations, it's kind of our starting point um, when we're grading sites. We want at least a 1% grade across concrete pavement and at least a 2% grade uh, across asphalt pavement. That eliminates a lot of the bird baths and, and uh, you know, wet spots that you may see in, in parking lots after construction. <clears throat> um, some places when you're working in coastal areas, you're not going to get anywhere close to this. Um, it just doesn't make financial sense to do it, um, but we want to try to maximize those slopes as best we can. Um, same thing across lawn areas, we can keep that 2% or greater. Um, that'll help keep uh, positive drainage uh, away from buildings. Um, maximum slope across parking areas, if you're working in a little more uh, mountainous terrain, uh, we try to keep those 5% or less. Um, we have had to get more aggressive in some places uh, and push that issue, but that's kind of our starting point. We wanna stay below five if we can. If we're, if we're doing a um, a grocery store or shopping center where you're going to have shopping carts, we're going to be much less than five because you, know, you don't want your shopping carts rolling away when you're pulling them, uh, pushing them around to, to your cars. As I mentioned, there's always exceptions to these guidelines, um, but that's kind of our starting point. That's our goal when we start off. So on the stormwater management side, <clears throat> we get a lot of questions about this of what we're designing for and how we design to it. So we'll go through some quick um, uh, examples of that. Um, really the, the regulatory goal is low impact development. So if we can minimize the impervious cover, we're gonna minimize the stormwater runoff from a site. When we do increase the, the impervious cover, we wanna try to promote ways that that water can infiltrate back into the soil um, just like it was doing before the development. So that can a lot of times lead into lots of smaller measures instead of one big pond in the area. Um, uh, in many cases, we end up with one big pond um, just because of the way um, uh, things have to come together. Uh, but uh, at the end of the day, we're trying to put that water back into the soil, into the earth, versus just having it run off and get into our creeks and tributaries and cause flooding and those types of items. So we're, we're both treating the water from a stormwater quality standpoint and we're managing the amount of stormwater quantity that's leaving the site. Um, so we're not increasing the amount of water that's going into our streams, uh, creeks, rivers, and lakes. Um, so our design, is to, is to, our design goal is to minimize the required number of uh, best management practices 
um, uh, on the site if we can. Um, we want to ha have a lower first cost uh, as well as less ongoing maintenance cost. Now that's can be a tough uh, uh, a tough uh, variable to to plan to when you're trying to do both. But we want to understand what's most important to the owner. Do they want to build a pond and hardly ever have to uh, maintain it other than cut the grass, or do they want something a little more aesthetically pleasing? They can work with the terrain, something with some bioretention, but it's going to be a little more maintenance on the long cause. Um, what kind so, of ongoing maintenance is required with a BMP? So uh, on the ponds, uh, which is what you see on a lot of cases, you know, there's typical maintenance as far as cutting the grass and, and keeping the growth uh, out of it. Uh, there's also cleaning out of outlet structures, you know, if they silt up over time. Um, you know, just when you get really heavy rain events, there's some maintenance required on a yearly basis just to keep those cleaned out so water can leave the site and get out um, uh, quite a bit. Uh, if you got underground detention, there's, there's uh, regular cleaning out of the filter media within some of those, uh, some of those items and things that they'll have to budget for on a year to year basis. You know, take picking the trash up out when it washes out of a um, uh, parking lot and goes into a pond. Um, so a lot of cases, your landscaper can take care of those, but it's something we want to make sure uh, the owner understands that in many localities nowadays make you sign a maintenance agreement that, that tells you how often you have to maintain it, uh, making sure the grass is growing on it, making sure you don't have trees growing in it, you know, anything that can um, obstruct stormwater from running out of the site. <clears throat> Um, bioretention areas where you've got a lot of plantings, um, you know, keeping the weeds out of them, keeping uh, water from ponding permanently in there, uh, uh, you know, pruning trees, pruning shrubs, you know, th those can get pretty extensive as well. <clears throat> so some of the BMPs that we have uh, uh, access to or anything from simple rooftop disconnection, grass channels, rainwater harvesting, bioretention, dry swales, wet swales, wet ponds, um, extended detention. And then there's a list of growing list of uh, proprietary BMPs. So these are um, uh, items that uh, companies have designed, developed, and they manufacture, and they have gone and gotten approval from state and local areas that can separate uh, pollutants and, and solids uh, from, uh, uh, from stormwater, um, as well as uh, handle the stormwater quantity. So we're always monitoring those to see if there's a, a good application for those. So what do some of these BMPs look like? Um, simple rooftop disconnection. So we're, instead of piping all of our stormwater away from, um, uh, from the roof, away from buildings, uh, we're discharging our stormwater into a little bioretention area. So again, we're trying to promote water from infiltrating into the soil. Um, and then when it, uh, during heavy rain events, there's a, there's a uh, catch basin here that's set a little higher that it can overflow. And that way you're treating the first flush of storm um, throughout this, uh, uh, this little area, uh, but you can handle the uh, heavier storm events before water starts backing into the building. Um, you can do simple disconnects, uh, you can do alternative disconnects of uh, where you're just, um, water is flowing from a, pervy, from a downspout to a pervious area um, versus uh, having water flows from a downspout to another um, uh, runoff practice, whether that's some below ground item or uh, any of those. Uh, here's another example of rooftop disconnection. We got some pervious pavers. Here, uh, pretty simple application. You don't get a ton of credit for stormwater management on these, but you do get some runoff reduction credit because you're promoting water to go into the soil versus um, running off you know, into a pipe system and getting piped down to a creek. Uh, permeable pavement, we get a lot of questions about these. Um, uh, it really depends on your soil types. Um, many cases you have to if you're in a coastal area, we got a lot of sandy material. This can work well because you can water can permeate the the pavers and get into that sandy soil and really be integrated back into um, uh, into the groundwater system. When you're in more areas that have a lot of clays, you'll you'll set these pavers on a bed of um, 
sand with some under drains in it uh, because water's not going to continue to permeate that clay material that's below it. So we may have to um, infiltrate through the sand to filter it out and then have it piped away during heavier storm events. Uh, bioretention or rain gardens, it, like uh, a lot of people call them, these are just depressions where we have uh, a lot of uh, water that will again try to get infiltrated through a, a filter bed. Um, if you've got permeable soils, you may not have to do an underdrain. In most cases, you do have to do underdrains. Um, so water gets filtered out as it goes through the sand and gets piped away <clears throat> once it gets to the bottom of this filter media. Again, we'll have an overflow structure. If this area fills up during a really heavy rain event, water can get out after you've had that first flush of storm that really uh, has most of the, uh, most of the pollutants. Uh, here's a simple, simpler uh, uh, example of bioretention. These are just some little pocket bioretention areas. So water runs off the road, comes to a little curb cut and into a little plant bed. <clears throat> so you're treating water, you're getting credit for it, just not on a, <clears throat> on a huge, large scale. And some other areas you can see where we're just creating these depressions with a lot of uh, soil areas where we're trying to get water to come into the site. <clears throat> uh, dry swales, you see a lot of these in, in highway medians. Um, these uh, are similar to buyer retention areas. We're trying to, trying to get uh, a little more um, uh, infiltration throughout the site. And again, uh, um, uh, an under drain to allow water to, uh, to get out. Uh, not getting a ton of credit for stormwater treatment here, but it's it's adding up. And a wet swale uh, where, you, where you're topographically challenged and don't have a lot of fall, um, you may have to pond water within these swales. You see a lot of cattails in a lot of places, you see these in coastal areas where water just doesn't want to flow. Um, and uh, the idea on this is you're creating a place for water to go. It's going to sit there uh, during uh, periods where a lot of the pollutants can get uh, can settle out um, and get infiltrated into the soils versus getting piped away. Um, we got to be careful with these that we don't create mosquito habitat. So we really look closely at outlet control outlet control measures. So we don't have uh, you know just six inches of water in them that um, can can be a mosquito habitat. Uh, to get your most bang for your buck, a lot of times we'll do treatment trains. So you may have simple roof disconnect, a grass channel, and all of this, uh, after it infiltrates and gets and uh, gets into an under drain, it eventually ends up in a wet pond. So you're, you're multiplying your removal. And then when you have a pond at the end, water's getting, uh, the, the pollutants are getting, are settling out here. And then the overflow goes out at a slower rate. So um, you can multiply those and uh, really have some good removal without it being, um, uh, you know, too obvious of what you're doing. <clears throat> so how do these goals mesh with the stages of design? Um, uh, you know, during each phase of projects, and sometimes owners go straight into construction documents, but we kind of break it down uh, by concept, SD, DD, and CD. So in the concept design, this is when we're doing our constraint constraints maps, uh, developing a site program, looking at the adjacencies, um, looking at high level of grading constraints. Then we get into schematics. Schematics, um, at the end of schematics, we should have a, have a drawing that is, this is what the client wants. We got the program identified, it's on the plan, they're okay with it. Um, building footprints, probably 95% set, parking numbers finalized, vehicle turning movements have been checked, so we know it works. Uh, then we get into design development, which is preliminary design. This is, uh, this is where we identify that this plan will work and will meet the budget goals. So we've developed a grading plan to make sure the site balances. Um, adjustments to the layout may still be required based on grading, but we're, we're pretty well set. Building footprint should be 100% set at that point. Um, we should have a concept layout of uh, piping and uh, understand how any construction phasing uh, should, should take place. Uh, then we roll into, into construction documents, which are our working drawings. Um, at the end of this, the plan should be clear, thorough, and easy to bid and build. Um, we should be going through our regulatory approvals, have detailed plan, plan for all piping connections to the building, detailed grading, 
ADA approaches detail, specs on the project, and uh, be fully coordinated on bid documents. So this graph shows how these goals, uh, you know, how, um, uh, how revisions to the plan at different phases of the project can either positively or negatively impact a budget. So when we're just scoping the project and coming through concept, the changes that we're making can have a high value uh, to the client. So we're, we're dialing in their layout, we're, we're getting all their site program elements going. The further we get along design development, um, the changes we're making at that point have less of a value to the client. And by the time we get all the way through bidding, any changes to the documents are all of a sudden gonna have a negative cost to the client. Um, so this is when we get hit with change orders and extra costs that maybe we haven't been um, uh, anticipating. So this is really just demonstrating that the earlier we can make those changes and get things dialed in and, and make sure everything's working together between the building, the site, and other trades, the more value it's gonna to be to the client. If we're doing it after we've got a contractor already out on site, um, that's when we're having the tough conversations with the owners on, um, on overall uh, site. <clears throat> so at the end of the day, we're trying to get to a collaborative site design. You know, um, a, a design charrette is preferred when we can all get in the room together and spitball ideas and communicate with one another. Um, that really lends itself to, uh, uh, to having a positive outcome to the project. It's an iterative process, so we're, we're working through constraints. The, the goals of the project may be tweaked over time, and we may have to adjust on the fly there. Um, at a certain point, we got to get to the pencils down part. Um, so we got to stop designing uh, changes to the function uh, of the project or the building should stop after schematics and changes to the exterior footprint should stop after design development. Um, that's wishful thinking in some cases. We've got owners that change their minds um, almost daily, but um, really that's, that's our goal is, you know, we wanna to get to a point where the design is set and we're not uh, changing things on the fly late in the project. Um, we wanna be able to manage the unforeseen conditions and have, have a plan to, to deal with those. You know, you can do that by bidding allowances for dealing with rock and unsuitable soils, um, you know, having uh, uh, prices for, uh, you know, going to geotechnical fabric versus having to do a bunch of hauling bad dirt off and bringing good dirt in. Um, and, you know, really important what the client is really expecting us to do is coordinate all points of connection between the site and the building. When those are disjointed and these aren't matching up, it's pretty obvious we haven't spent the time coordinating um, like we should have. Water, sewer, sidewalks, storm sewer, we gotta over communicate those items to make sure we're, we're blending things um, uh, very well. So then finally, uh, we're to the final uh, step five of the project, which is regulatory review and permitting. Um, my, my, uh, uh, my advice here is to meet with staff early on to determine all project requirements and standards. Um, never ceases uh, to, uh, to amaze me that most projects will, you know, you'll get that curveball from staff uh, at some point, something that you could have researched their code and memorized their code. And because they've got some kind of um, other requirement that may not be written out that they're going to throw at you or maybe there's some history on the site that they can they can get you so really picking their brain and introducing the project will help you identify those items early on um, we need to identify all required permits and approvals early on um, this can involve multiple agency and multiple submittals especially on the site side uh, we deal with uh, different um, submittal processes and different um, uh, permitting authorities on almost every project. Um, we need to identify the schedule and the critical path for permitting. Um, if you're trying to get a driveway permit from DOT versus a stormwater permit from DEQ, those can take drastically different uh, times to, to, uh, to complete. So really understanding which one's gonna take the longest, how long it's gonna take, and building that into the schedule is, is important. Um, site permitting often takes longer than building permitting. For whatever reason, um, a lot of the counties that we deal in uh, are, you know, have rigid processes and they just don't go as fast as the building inspector uh, reviewing uh, plans. 
and really, you know, we want to work the schedule backwards. So uh, from the desired occupancy date, how long is it going to take to build it? How long is it going to take to permit it? How long is it going to take to design it? And really start plugging in those dates into the schedule so we can hit, make sure we're, uh, we're hitting those milestones to keep what the client really cares about, which is the end date of, of when they're going to occupy the building. And um, last but not least is uh, even though we've gotten through permitting and the building's under construction, we need to make a list of all requirements for, for certificate of occupancy um, of the building. Um, there are a ton of requirements both on the building side and on the site side, whether it's as-built submittals, easement recordation, dedication of right-of-way, a number of things that could be time consuming that if you wait until the, the contractor is ready to uh, uh, get to substantial completion, it could end up delaying your CO of your building. So let's identify those early on, probably during permitting, and build those, have the, have the contractor track them in his schedule so they can give you the, the heads up, okay, we need to submit as built. We need to continue to, to go through this. So that's kind of our steps of, uh, of how we try to tackle projects. Um, hope some of it is informative on our thought process uh, and how we work with different design team members, um, how we work with owners to try to, you know, avoid those head scratchers or those oops at the end of the day that we're, that we're trying to, um, trying to accomplish. Uh, so that's all I've got. We'll do a little Q and A if Sarah, if you've got any more questions on the list. Brian, I've got two more on the list here. Um, one is, is the highest acceptable curb height six inches or can it be higher? Uh, we have done some higher than six inches. Um, where you run into challenges there is, um, is fall protection from an ADA standpoint. So if you, you can do a taller curb, but you typically don't want to do it if you've got a sidewalk on the back side of that curb. Yeah, you don't want to create a situation. Anything that's, you know, with the height of that curb gets too high that um, somebody could become injured if they, you know, fell off the, the side of the sidewalk. We often do taller curbs, especially in areas where you may have truck or trailer parking um, to keep, you know, the, the tractor trailer drivers from just backing over top of the curb. Um, so we'll do some taller curbs in, in those areas. Uh, we've done some taller curbs in other areas, but you may want to look at doing some guardrail or handrail to, uh, to create a barrier so nobody will uh, slip and fall off of uh, a curb that's taller than six inches or create a tripping hazard. Okay. Um, overall, how have you guys found the permitting process to be recently? Our firm has found some jurisdictions to have crazy requirements that extend the length of the process exponentially. The, um, the permitting environment today is, uh, I would say, as complicated as probably it's ever been. Um, uh, if you've worked in the business long enough, you know that there, that the trend is to add more regulations, not less regulations. And every time they get added, um, another layer of permitting has to, we have to go through it. Um, part of what's a big push on the system right now is, um, uh, there's a lot going on. There's a lot of development taking place and a lot of these review agencies either aren't funded or staffed at the levels to, to take on um, the amount of projects that are out there. So uh, yeah, I, I would say our, the, the timelines for reviewers, for reviews um, across most of our offices, not all, but most of our offices is that those review times are taking longer, um, you know, year by year than, than getting shorter. There are some places that are, that are trying to be uh, as pro-business as they can and, and try not to be a hindrance to development. But uh, at certain points, it becomes a, a workload and staffing thing for the guy, for the folks that are doing reviews on the end. Great. And I know a lot of you um, have other meetings that you're going attending to right now. We'll continue answering questions. But until then, um, just wanted to let you guys know, we are hosting these webinars every week for the next several weeks. So if you need more um, credits, hop on our website um, and register for next Thursdays. Um, and we have um, more scheduled out there right now. You will also receive a copy of this presentation with your certificate of completion um, when you get that in the email. So just FYI to that. Um, other questions, Brian, we have. Um, 
sorry, I couldn't see it. Um, what, are, what are a few of the issues that you've seen delaying projects by owners or view agencies that could be better managed earlier in the design? Um, I'd say the number one challenge that we run into right now is um, what we joke a lot around the office is all the good sites are gone. <laughs> so every site that, that's coming across our desk now, uh, almost every site, um, has some level of challenges. Uh, there's a reason why it hasn't been developed. There's a, you know, uh, there, there's, there's something going on with it. And what we have to do is really dig in deep early on to identify what that is. It, you know, is it a soils issue? Is it a uh, land use issue? Is it, you know, a transportation issue? Uh, to really identify that uh, uh, as potential deal killers um, so the owner's not spending money on, on a project and we get way down the road and then uncover it. So that's the biggest challenge I would say we run into is uncovering what are, what are the major constraints, what are the potential deal killers, um, and then trying to figure out how to make it work. Um, almost no client or developer comes to us with the perfect amount of dirt on the perfect site. It's always how can we uh, shrink the building, how can we, you know, get creative with some of our parking solutions? How can we grade this a little different to get their desired program to fit within these constraints? Um, it's, a, it's a real challenge at times, but it's what keeps our, our business fun to do as well. Everything's a little unique for us. Um, since vehicle preferences have changed recently in America from sedans to SUVs and trucks, has Timmons Group been larging for their prototypical um, parking dimensions and details? Uh, I would say more times than not, we will start with the recommended um, uh, parking space size that's set by the zoning ordinance. Sometimes it's nine feet by 18, sometimes it's 10 feet by 18, sometimes it's 10 foot by 20. We'll use that as a starting point, but we will ask that question to our clients as part of the site programming exercise. Um, we've had, for instance, uh, some industrial clients that their workforce all drive Ford F-150 crew cab trucks, and they want extra long parking spaces to, um, uh, to, to accommodate those larger vehicles. Um, we don't want to cram a bunch of compact car spaces in there if everybody, like you said, is, is driving SUVs, but we'll ask that question. Um, we may start with our concept on the code minimum, um, uh, you know, at the nine by 18 level, but we'll ask that question and, and enlarge and adjust uh, as needed. I think there's one here for any new requirements from municipalities for any of this. Any, I'm sorry, say that again. Is there any, are there any new requirements for municipalities? Oh, um, <clears throat> they're evolving. I would say uh, most of your larger localities, your more urban centers, um, they're tweaking ordinances. They, they may be, it's maybe mainly from a land use and buffering standpoint. So if you're building adjacent to residential areas, they may have some more restriction, rest restrictive measures uh, as far as building adjacent to residential. Um, but we're really starting to see some, some more of the rural areas uh, that may have their 1960s ordinance that they're finally getting around to updating. And they're, they're starting to, you know, they're, they're taking copies from other localities and adapting them to their site. So we're seeing more of the rural areas get caught up and more of the urban areas get more detailed and finite in the how do you protect adjacent landowners, I would say are the biggest ones we're seeing. Okay, that's all I have in the queue here. Um, Brian, unless you have anything else, this is no. the end of the program. We appreciate y'all logging on and joining us for this new series that we've launched and Hope you can join us next week. Um, if you haven't already registered, go ahead and hop on our website um, and hopefully to see you then. Thanks everybody. Thanks everybody.